Greetings, physicists. This lecture will be about friction and drag forces in general. So I would say that one of the, the biggest reasons that students tend to misunderstand Newton's laws of motion is that they are not intuitive in a world where friction exists. Uh, for instance, a body in motion tends to stay in motion. That is not what you grew up understanding. If you pushed a ball forward, you probably came, had an idea that that ball would come to rest over a certain period of time, uh, not just keep going forever. And that's because there's friction in this world. Newton's laws probably would make a lot more sense if you grew up living in space and, and just floating around and, and not having friction with, with uh, you know, the, the space around you. So let's talk about friction. Let's talk about this idea. Whoops, I'm going to drag that around. That if you had, well, let's see here. Yeah, let's put that there. You have a surface. You have a big heavy crate resting on that surface. And you're going to come up to it, give it a shove. You don't expect that crate to go on sliding forever, especially if I drew the surface truly flat. Well, here's why that, that doesn't happen. Here's why we don't expect friction, or why we don't expect things to slide forever. If we were to take a magnifying glass, put it right there, and zoom in on the, the point where the crate interacts with the ground, you would see that that crate is not smooth. In fact, if you were to go really, really, really tiny with your magnifying glass, you would see that crate is rough to some degree. And then the ground underneath it is also not smooth. It may look smooth, but it's got all kinds of bumps and stuff. And so when it tries to slide forward like this, essentially there are pieces of each surface that get in each other's way. And that's our understanding of friction, is that you could never have two surfaces that are perfectly smooth, even if you had something like water. We know that uh, if you walk on a uh, on like polished marble floor and someone spills their glass of water, there's a very good chance you're going to slip. You don't think of that surface as having friction, but it has a little bit. And even molecules of water, right? If we zoom in on a molecule of water, they have bumps. They have atoms that stick out. That can rub against other atoms. So. All you can do is get very close to zero friction in the world of physics. Uh, and oftentimes in certain problems, we will approximate it. You'll see like an ice skater on an ice rink, and we will say, assume friction is zero. We're assuming that, but it's not true. There is always some friction there. All right, so that's the nature of friction. And so what we'll say is that in order for me to push this crate, I have to build up enough force to beat all of those little pieces that are in the way. I have to essentially there's a threshold that I have to overcome of force that's resisting me before I can get that crate moving. And even once it starts moving, that surface is still rough and that friction force is going to resist me. So here's the idea with friction. Uh, if you have a surface with some friction, which all real surfaces do, and an object has a velocity in a certain direction, that is, we'll assume right now it's parallel to that surface, because they're touching, then there will always exist some frictional force, which we'll call lowercase f, that is 180 degrees to the velocity, that is in the exact opposite direction of the velocity. Always, always, always. So if friction exists, it directly opposes the velocity. All right. That's friction. And now let's talk about how we are going to calculate it. You can try this as an experiment. Take a surface. Put a textbook on that surface. And try to drag it. Maybe attach a little cord to it. And pull. Put some tension on that textbook. And you're going to drag it across that surface. At some point, it will go at a constant speed. Even though you're applying a constant tension force to it. Now, 
What does that mean according to Newton's second law? Well, actually, this is really more of a Newton's first law kind of problem. What it means is that you, even if you apply a constant tension force, you're not getting an acceleration, so there must be an equal and opposite force in the other direction that is resisting the motion or causing it to go at a constant speed because sigma f has to be zero if there's no acceleration. Well, that's what the friction is doing. So whenever we're going to try and figure out the, the frictional force on some object, uh, it's, easy, it's easier to do if you put it at a constant speed. So tension forward, friction backward, etc. And so we could say the tension forward, and here I'm making tension the forward direction or the positive direction, uh, plus the friction, or since friction is backward, we can make it negative. Tension minus friction would equal the mass of the textbook times its acceleration, but the acceleration, of course, is zero in this case, so the tension force has to equal the friction force, like that. Well, let's say that instead of pulling one uh, textbook, we put in two textbooks. You would find that in order, uh, you would find that it would take a greater tension force to keep you going at that constant speed. And uh, which means that the higher you pile up those books, the bigger this friction force becomes. Well, what's increasing as I stack those, uh, those textbooks on top of each other, what's increasing is this interaction between the surface, this normal force that the surface pushes on the bottom of the bottom textbook. So what we find is that the friction force, this lowercase f, is proportional to the normal force. And in fact, we're going to give it a letter. If we want to make it perfectly equal, you can graph this. You can take and graph the friction force versus the normal force, and you will get a straight line. So because that's a constant, we're going to, we're going to actually come up with a name for that constant, the slope k. So if we were doing this, this is a y equals kx graph, yes, but on the y-axis is the friction force equal to k times, on the x-axis we have, the normal force. So, that k value that we just wrote, we're going to call that, we're going to give that a, its own letter, the Greek letter mu. So that the frictional force is equal to that mu, whatever the slope of that line is, times the normal force. And what you see with this, uh, I'll, I'll alter this graph just a little bit to give you an idea, and I'll do it in different colors, like this. So let's suppose that we're dragging the same textbook, we're not changing, uh, or well, textbooks and we're altering the masses and things and we're measuring the frictions and we do it across different surfaces. You might say that this is like this blue surface might be polished marble like that and maybe the the red surface is just like a wooden table and maybe the black surface is is like uh, sandpaper or something. Well, what you see, what we what we see is the steeper the line is, uh, the bigger the ratio of the frictional force to the normal force. Well, what that's really corresponding to is the roughness of the surface. The polished marble has is a very very non rough surface, and the sandpaper is a very rough surface here. And you can think of something that's even rougher than sandpaper. I can't think of one right now, but that might be the yellow line. So that's what that mu corresponds to. The mu is the slope, and the steeper the slope, the rougher the surface we're getting. So, and I'm doing it again. Just want to do this. There we go. So mu, we will call the coefficient of friction. And the coefficient of friction are highly measured values by engineers. If you're building things that are uh, potentially could rub, like a machine where the parts rub together, you really want to know how much friction is going to be in there. That's super important. So engineers will take two, two materials and they'll rub them together, and they'll say, 
and they'll make they'll take this uh, they'll do an experiment right and they'll graph it like we did up here and then they'll write it down so if you go online and google what is the coefficient of friction between rubber and asphalt probably a very highly studied coefficient of friction if you google steel on steel that's probably important that people would want to know uh, in machines and things or or brass on steel or wood on 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 steel or things. So all of those, there's, there are big tables of these kinds of information, of coefficients of friction. So in order to know a coefficient of friction, it either has to be given to you in the problem or we might be solving for it. Now, in addition to this, we have a couple types of friction. And I want you to think of like, uh, you're going to help your mom move furniture in your living room. Let's draw that line a little more horizontal. We assume your living room is not on a slant, I hope. And you got a big bookcase. And you and your mom are going to push that bookcase across a carpeted floor, and carpet probably has a pretty big coefficient of friction. So you're going to drag it. So you're going to apply this force to it as, it, as you try to move it. What you may have noticed when you do this is that when you push that bookcase or start trying to push it and it's not moving yet, you build up this big, 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 big force to try and get it moving. Okay? And then once you get it moving, it feels like it's easier. Like it's easier to, to, to move the object across the ground once it's already moving, but if you let it stop, then it takes a big force to get it started. So this is like, this is like the moving force. Or sorry, this is the, the force where it's not moving. And this is the force where it's moving. And that's highly measured as well. This, this idea that it takes more force to start an object moving than to keep it moving has to do with uh, two different coefficients of friction. So right now what we're talking about, we're talking about a mu between... Uh, let's say it's a wooden bookcase, that would be wood rubbing on carpet. So w a wood carpet coefficient of friction. You could look that up. I don't know if anyone bothered to post that online somewhere, but it's a thing. Probably depends on what type of carpet, what type of wood, etc. Um, so let's just say there's some coefficient of friction. There's a different one for moving and a different one for not moving. In other words, this mu is a big mu, and this mu is a little bit smaller. So we're going to give them their own names. When you are not moving, you are static. So we'll say that's a mu static. When you are moving, that's kinetic, right? Like kinematics. So we'll put a little k, a little sub k next to that mu. So a mu sub s would be a static coefficient of friction. That's, that's the ratio of force it takes to get an object moving. Once it's moving, that coefficient actually lowers, and it only takes uh, this much, right? That's the lower one. So mu k always lower than mu s. So that's how friction works. And so a lot of friction problems, if I were to do a real quick f equals ma problem, we'll say, we'll do our crate example. You push the crate across the ground like this, and you push it at a constant speed. And the force you use, the force you use to push it with is 100 newtons. And the crate itself, let's call this a, let's make it a 50 kilogram crate. And our question would be something like, what is the coefficient of kinetic friction between the ground and the crate? Well, to do this, we're going to need, of course, a free body diagram. We use that all the time. So let's draw the crate as a dot. Your force is acting to the right, so we'll call that your 100 Newton force. Gravity, of course, is acting down. That's mg. The normal force is opposing gravity, and we assume they are equal because the crate doesn't leave the surface. But it's going at a constant speed, so this has to be a balanced set of forces. So the only force left can be friction. 
and we'll put a little f there to be the force of friction. Well, we can do a real quick sigma f equals ma in the horizontal direction. We know a is zero, so sigma f is actually zero, so we can say that the 100 newton force forward minus the friction force backward has to equal zero, so the friction force has to also be 100 newtons. We can also say that the normal force up and the mg down similarly must be equal because it's not accelerating up or down. So the normal force would equal mg, and in this case, that's uh, 9.8 by 50, which should be, what, 490? Yeah, 490 newtons. So we have a normal force. Good. We have a friction force. So we could actually solve this equation. We could say that the friction force equal to mu times the normal force, in this case it happens to be mu kinetic, that friction force is 100 newtons, has to be equal to mu times the normal force, which in this case is 490 newtons. Newtons will cancel, and I will get 100 over 490. Scroll down here, come on. So 100 divided by 490, which is almost a fifth, which should be very close to 0.2. calculator. There we go. Yeah, 0 0.204. 0 0.204, and that's my mu kinetic. Notice that because Newton's canceled, there actually are no units for the coefficient of friction. It is a unitless concept. It's just a ratio. And uh, that doesn't happen too often in physics, but that would be correct if you were to write this on a test. You would not put units with your, your coefficients of friction if somebody was asking for them. All right, so that's friction. Let's go on to drag. Let's talk about that briefly. Drag is very similar. Um, let's say you uh, jump out of an airplane because you're a skydiver and you fall through the air. As you fall through the air, you have a velocity downward. That velocity is probably going to increase at the beginning of your jump. But you will feel a force backwards on you. You will feel a force up. And that's a drag force. In fact, I'm going to draw that with a capital F. F sub D. F drag. And what you're feeling is essentially molecules of air bumping into you. Because the air is not just this empty space, there's all these little air molecules, and you fall into them, and they push back on you. That's a drag force. Well, what's interesting about drag forces, they're similar to friction forces in that they are always 180 degrees to your motion. So if you're going straight down, the drag force has to be straight up. If you are on the freeway and you put your hand out the window and you feel the air bumping into your hand, well, the... the uh, that drag force is pushing the exact opposite direction your hand is moving. Always happens that way. And the difference is that unlike... Well, I won't say that here. The diff the, what, one peculiarity of the drag force is that it is based on your velocity. So the faster you fall, the bigger the force you get. And this probably will be intuitive to most people. If you are standing still... Unless the wind is blowing, you don't feel a drag force from the wind. If you run forward, you might feel a little bit of a drag force. If you ride your bike faster than that, you will feel a bigger drag force. And when you're on the uh, freeway going really fast, the drag force feels very big. So the, the bigger the V, the bigger the drag force. So we'll write this proportionality. The drag force is proportional to the velocity. And there, there are larger equations than that, but we're not going to get into them. We're basically just going to write that equation, that F drag will be equal to some proportionality constant times V. And that's, that'll be good enough for the level of physics that we are at right now. Well, this brings up an interesting idea for skydivers. 
when you jump, that means that the faster you fall, the bigger the resistive force. So let's draw a free body diagram on you. Let's say you've just jumped out of the plane. Here's the plane. Like you just left and you, you haven't started falling yet. It's the very instant you stepped out of the plane because what a perfect picture I drew. So you don't have any downward velocity yet. So right now, if I draw your free body diagram for you, there's your dot, the only thing acting on you right now is gravity, mg pulling you down. And as far as we know right now, near the surface of the Earth, that should be a constant value of g. You should have a 9.8 and your mass. So these two things are constant. Come on, there we go. Which means that you'll have a constant acceleration downward. But except that as soon as you start to pick up some speed, so let's draw some little speed arrows because you're falling. As soon as you start to pick up some speed, this happens. We get some drag force. A little speed means some drag. Where does that point? Well, it points up. Little tiny arrow there. Well, that means that your net force pulling you downward is going to be not as much as gravity normally was. That net force will be a little bit shorter if I just draw the, the leftover. But you're still going to accelerate. You're just now not accelerating it as quickly as you were. You're not at 9.8. Maybe you go down to 9. And then you start, so you start to go faster, and you go, you go to a higher speed. Well, as you go to a higher speed, you go to a higher drag. So this force starts to get bigger, which means this arrow starts to get shorter. And so you can see at some point, if you fall long enough and go fast enough, you will get to some point where the drag force, will, I'm just pretend I'm extending this arrow instead of drawing multiples. That drag force will get so big that it will exactly counter the downward force. And then you won't go any faster. You will just be falling as fast as you possibly can. And this happens in a matter of seconds. This is a very quick effect. You get up to speed very quickly. So when you reach this here, and your velocity can't be any bigger, that's your maximum falling velocity. Well, we have a name for that. We're going to call that the terminal velocity. Now, this depends, of course, on how much that drag coefficient is, right? I'll, I'll, I'll redraw the equation. F drag will equal some coefficient k times v. So the bigger that k is, the bigger the drag force. So if you have a very small coefficient, you can get up to a very large velocity before your drag force equals your mg. If you have a very large k, you get up to speed very quickly and you don't fall as fast. So there's an inverse relationship between k and v. So Skydiving is fun because your body, if you can make your body very small uh, profile-wise, right, if, if, you're, if, you're, if the air rushing up to hit you or you rushing down to hit the air, if you don't have a lot of cross-sectional area, you will fall very fast. But you don't want to keep falling very fast because the ground is down here somewhere. So before you hit the ground, you need a way to make your K very large so that your velocity becomes smaller such that when you hit the ground, it's not such a big velocity and you don't, you know, expire. So how do you make your K bigger? Well, you make your surface area bigger. So you'll take yourself, who is only hitting this many molecules of air, and you'll attach a big parachute. And now you're catching this many molecules of air in the parachute. And that increases this K, this drag coefficient, which is going to make that velocity smaller. So that's the idea behind drag. This is true not just for skydiving. This is true for cars. If you look at um, one of the least aerodynamic cars out there, the Scion, one of those big boxy cars, all right, that car is, is going to hit all the air molecules right up front. It has a lot of drag. It will go fast if you put a big motor in it but it has to work harder to go fast than some other cars, like if you had, for instance, a Corvette. Pretend I know how to draw a Corvette. Those are long, flat cars. Look at all the air that's going to miss it that would have hit the Scion. And it's rounded, right? The front is pointy. So 
air goes a lot easier around this. So this car has a lower K value than this car and can go a lot faster with less work because of it. All of other things being equal, of course. All right, so that's your lecture on friction and drag.